Hello and welcome to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And this is another of our podcasts looking into ethics and responsibility in the music industry. And this one is the second of two episodes where we're speaking directly to artists about the pressures they felt from their industry and the effect it has had on them as human beings. We're about to hear from the artist Totally Enormous Extinct Dinosaurs, or Orlando Higginbottom, as he's known to his family and friends, and he'll be talking about his experiences of working with record labels and discussing the need for them in 2022 based on a decade of experiences that have not been, let's say, wholly positive. Now, This Music Ally Focus podcast, just like Music Ally, provides an analysis rich and contextual guide to the music business. And this podcast is also going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time as Mayor the Dog could hypothetically roll over 1,300 times. Mayor was a very good girl and rolled over 52 times in one minute for her owner Wolfgang Lauenberger in February this year. Now, Talking of feeling completely disorientated and slightly nauseous as a result of something your owner made you do, Orlando, as the artist Totally Enormous Extinct Dinosaurs, has been highly vocal about his position on the current state of the music industry, including the statement, nobody should be signing a bad record deal, and perhaps nobody should be signing record deals at all. So we're going to be talking to him about the need for record labels in the current environment and his experiences in the recorded music industry, in which he has released two studio albums a decade apart, and how he felt he was let down by an industry that took advantage of him as a young artist. Let's go over to Orlando now. Okay, well, we're very happy to welcome uh, Orlando Higginbottom, better known to us as Totally Enormous Extinct Dinosaurs, to the Focus podcast. Hello, Orlando. Hi. Uh, thanks for joining us. Now, we're going to be talking about uh, the need for record labels in the current environment, what they do, what they can do better, and uh, what is and isn't working, based on Orlando's feelings on the usefulness of labels in 2022, um, which in turn is based on his experiences of the recorded music industry over the last decade or so, or beyond that, in which he's released two studio albums uh, a decade apart, which is a sort of key part to this story. Now, Orlando, you, you, you're, let's dig into that story a bit. Your second album is about to come out, 9th of September. To much excitement. I've seen a lot of people uh, enjoying what you've released so far in the lead up to it. But there's a bit of a backstory to the circumstances around its release and the context in which it's released. Can you explain this background of the story to us and what effect it has had on you and your work as a recording artist? Sure. Uh, So my first album came out in 2012, and that was uh, released on Polydor. Um, And uh, I'm definitely not going to throw them under the bus. It it wasn't a bad experience at all in terms of the day-to-day work, but it was a strange experience for me. I was pretty naive. I certainly didn't understand really what to expect from a record label um, and uh, a lot of the industry terminology and, and how the business works. So I, I went in with expectations and had a lot of them um, sort of smashed. Um, oh, however, right. had I, at this point, you know, with the understanding that I have now, I went in with unfair expectations. I do think. What were those happens. expectations? But, uh, just out of interest. That sure. How old were you at that point as well? Like, where, uh, where were you coming from? You know, twenty-five, um, which doesn't sound that young, but I think I was pretty young for 20, uh, twenty-five. Um, and I'd done some releases with a fantastic label called Greco Roman, and uh, I was being played on Radio One, and so me and my management did did the circuit of of majors in London and kind of sat down with I think about seven of them and uh you know started doing the thing where we got some deals together and I was very excited about that that sounded like a great prospect to me um of course there's an advance and at that point in my life I'd never seen a figure like that um even at that time, though, that figure wasn't a huge amount of money. And if I'd thought about it for a few more minutes, I would have seen that where that money has to go and what it has to do doesn't really leave anything for me. It's certainly not a salary. 
Um, this is in the early sort of, this is sort of 2010, 2011? Yeah, exactly, 2011, yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, while we're here uh, it, talking about this, the, the, the deal itself was a forever deal in, in perpetuity. I, I struggle with that phrase. Um, and uh, that's something that, that grinds my gears a bit now. What did, you, did, did that occur to you at the time? Because this is sort of central to your feelings around it, isn't it? Or part of it, you know, the, the, that it's forever. Did you, what did that mean to you at the time when, you, when someone said, oh, and by the way, this contract's forever? Well, I didn't like it, but I didn't know there was any other options. And I think that's sort of central to what I'm hoping to talk to you about today. Mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that I could do it another way. I thought it was sort of conditional and that if I wanted any kind of uh, advance and um, leverage, I would need to hand it over. Um, I also, you know, I didn't know how important uh, ownership and copyright is in this industry. I mean, it basically is what this industry is based on. Um, And I was, you know, this was the time, I'm sure you remember it, I'm sure everyone here listening remembers it, where people were saying, musicians earn their money touring and implicit in that statement is that you don't earn your money in any other way um which is <laughs> you know just sort of messed up but everyone was saying that i mean even my parents were saying that i remember at the time they were like well are we here that musicians earn their money on the road um and so yeah i, I didn't know there was an, an, any other ways and Perhaps at the time there weren't that many other options, really. It, it was a difficult time then, wasn't it? I mean, that was the, yeah. it was really at the trough in the recorded music industry yeah. period, wasn't it? Where you know, I remember working with artists at that time, and they were, you know, it was it was kind of devastating, really, because they pour all, pour all this time and effort into making recorded music, and and you don't get anything from it. You know, there was no mechanism. Right. I put that record out, and I think there are two sides to this story. One is the industry experience the business experience and one is my own personal experience and of course they're intertwined I'll try and make the personal stuff light Um, I kind of burnt myself out touring Um, uh, the, the the pressure from the business side was like right we did we did okay let's keep going let's get another song on radio one it was very much the radio one era Everything was about playlisting there. Um, and uh, I was just like, hang on a second. This doesn't feel right. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to do that. Let's, I, I, I put the brakes on, um, and I'm glad I did. Um, personally, I didn't really understand how to stop and take notice of where I had got to and sort of congratulate myself because it was successful. Um, I just didn't understand that. And I was always sort of in this sort of like pushing forward, pushing forward mindset. Um, And then, of course, uh, I was aware that um, I was still in my deal with Polydor. There were other albums that were they had options for. And um, I knew that I was in the red for this unrecouped for this first album. So that wasn't a very good feeling. Um, Add to that, (laughs) this is the only bit I'm going to do that's a little bit cheeky for for the label, but um, almost everybody I'd worked with at the label had um, left the label, let's say, is the nice way of putting it. So either they'd been fired or they'd chosen to go. Um, So this whole team that I'd known there and sort of the people that I'd gone, okay, I'll, I'll sign with you guys, they'd all gone elsewhere but the label wanted to continue to work with me. Um, and I said to them, you know, how do I know that you guys are going to be here in a year's time when I finish this record? You know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm in a, I'm in a deal with a piece of paper here as far as I'm concerned. There's no, there's no family. And I, uh, uh, you asked what was some of my, un, my unrealistic expectations. I thought that a label would be a kind of family. I thought that it would mm. be a community. Um, I thought that I would be in contact with the other artists on the label and I, I, I remember being kind of laughed out of a meeting room when I did suggest that. 
um, that it would be right. cool to chat to the other artists that are that are releasing records at the moment. You know, that was the last thing anyone wanted was the artists going, oh, well, I've got a slightly different deal to you, actually. Mine's a bit better. Oh, so do you feel they were actually trying to keep you separated as a sort of strategic? <clears throat> uh, whether consciously or not, that is a right. thing in, in music, you know, and, and I, I think artists are portrayed as in competition with each other. We're not. We're, we're on the same side very much. Mm. And um, one thing I would encourage and I try to do with my friends is be very transparent about what deals we're doing and um you know <clears throat> because like i said people don't realize what is out there and what is available and the first time you describe a distribution deal or a label deal <clears throat> sorry a label services deal to an artist that's done a deal with a major label their head explodes they can't believe it they can't believe that it's it's the other way around and they can own uh, the record and be taking in 80% of royalties. Um, so, yeah, having those conversations was not possible at the time, though obviously it starts to happen once you start touring and bumping into people backstage and, you know, people yeah. start telling their stories and it's like, ouch, you know, that sounds painful. Well, here's my experience and da-da-da. Um, so I get, I'm, I'm going to keep telling this story, even though it's rambling on. Um, I uh, managed to get out of that Polydor deal because they, there was a loophole. They wanted to, um, there was a minimum, you've all seen this, there was a minimum advance they had to hit to take the option. And they wanted to change a few things in the contract that wouldn't, and they wouldn't hit that advance, which meant that the contract, the option became void. So I was able to, uh, walk away from that amazingly so happy that they made that little slip up because um, I I think if I'd stayed in that deal and been going through what I was going through and had to deliver a record to Universal I probably would have quit the music business um, right. and then uh, yeah it took me a while um, went through some some personal <laughs> uh, lows and uh, tried to figure out how to build a team and a system where I would feel in control enough, supported enough, and um, would have and feel the ownership of my work, um, would feel that there is a direct line between me and my listener and as few unnecessary middlemen as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and I feel like I've got a, quite a good version of that now. It's taken a few experiments. Um, so through this yeah. time, you've, you, you've been still making music, remixing, producing, yeah. doing all sorts of things in this period. But was that part of that process of finding this new team, this new group of people who, who can support you the way you want uh, it was just part of being active, you know, just continuing to be a musician. I, I think our job is is craft, and um, we just have to keep keep moving. I, I I get very worried if I'm now I see it as a kind of warning sign if I haven't released something or I haven't been involved in something for a few months. It's sort of like okay, uh, something something's off here. There needs to just be a flow. Um, and and my my kind of business equation is definitely reliant on me doing production work and writing work for people and, and acting on that side as well. That's really important. Okay, and just to jump in here, if you're finding this useful and you'd like more of this in-depth news and trusted analysis waiting for you in your inbox every morning, as well as access to all of our industry-leading reports, head on over to musically.com slash subscribe. And you, yes, you may be eligible for a free Music Ally subscription via our corporate and sponsored subscriptions. So if you work for a DSP, a major label, an indie label, or if you're an artist manager an employee of a CMO or a publisher, you can check to see if it's available for you. Uh, it's musically.com slash subscription dash options. There's a link below the podcast to check out as well. Okay, let's go back to the interview. Perhaps we can talk a little bit about that rebuilding moment or the period of time where you say, okay, I've, I've experienced this this way. It's not what I wanted. It's not perhaps what I expected. Then you had some... 
there was, I guess that period, perhaps you were sort of trying to then clarify what you did want. And then you built a team that, and a situation that fulfilled that. So what is that then now, when you look back at it, what, what have you built and why? Okay. So in 2018, I sort of unplugged the dam. I hadn't released anything for three years and I just, I, I, I just put something on SoundCloud. Um, sounds pretty sort of innocent, but it but it it really got things going again. Um, people started picking up the phone, and um, I did a, a a small little agreement with AWOL um, for four songs, um, and was very happy with the terms in that. It was a, it was a really good deal. Um, for, uh, on, on between me and them. What I didn't get right at that time was realizing that I then needed to fit in some other pieces. So I needed to take on more responsibility. I needed to take on some of the traditional label responsibilities and find some third parties to do those or do them myself or, or have a manager do them or whatever it was. Yeah. So I didn't nail that EP. <laughs> um you know, there was some, some, the first track wasn't pitched properly, this kind of stuff that just sort of, uh, as are the basics. Um, and that was like the beginning of me understanding, okay, I can do this with a distributor, I can self-release, but I need, uh, I still need to do the things, I still need somebody working on marketing, I still need um, to make sure that my relationship with DSPs is real and active and whether you know and so whether that's me or someone else someone's got to do it um and I've kind of fallen in love with that like I I I really enjoy running that I really enjoy being across it I I love working with people I love finding good um uh collaborators and um I've got to say as well I'm sure we'll talk about this more but I feel very welcome when I approach Spotify or Apple um, as the artist and say, right. hi, I'm self-releasing this. Like, what, what can we do together? Uh, they're really happy to hear from me and very polite. And it's not like I need anyone to do that. Um, yeah. So that, that's been wonderful. How do you feel then as, um, you know, one of the things that record labels sort of have traditionally offered as part of the, the contract you sign with them is a sort of element of, or at least the feeling of de-risking, that you don't have to think about the building the manage, building the marketing team, you don't have to think about hiring the right people, you don't have to think about all these connectivity parts. You, you, you are signing to a machine which is su- supposedly well-oiled and works, and, and you, you, you're, you're also taking the financial responsibility away from yourself. Um, or at least that's you know that's, that's one way of looking at it. How did you feel about taking that risk on, where you have to make the decisions and you have to hire the people and you have to pay them and you have to uh, get them to, to to take the chances? Great, I feel great about that. I feel that it's uh, you know certainly I I think you know if you speak to managers, um, one of the parts of their job is sort of holding a record label accountable on making sure that they're actually doing what they said they were going to do and stoking the fire. Um, uh, So even if you are handing over responsibility to a label, you've still got to keep a hell of an eye on it and be really involved and speak to them as often as you can and and be in it. You're, you're, You're in it anyway. So you might as well, um, Take the financial responsibility on yourself. And, you know, if I was working with a label, I'd still be hiring the same radio pluggers that I'm hiring anyway. I'd still be hiring the same PR company that I'm hiring anyway. The only difference would, it, would, would, would be that the label would be having those conversations. Um, I might be paying more for those people if the label are having those conversations, you know. Um, uh, so a lot of the a lot of the third party characters and and companies are going to be around anyway. Um, as for the financial stuff, uh, look, I think we all know that like you can get a healthy marketing budget from a distributor. 
um, if you approach them with a good plan, uh, they want you to be able to do a good job. Um, these are very serious companies. It's not, um, you know, there's this confusion about what independent means. That the, the Orchard and AWOL and well, it's the same thing now. But that those those are that's serious. Those are serious people. Um, yeah. And they're not messing around. So they they want to they want you to do a good job. They want your record to do well. You have a little bit more responsibility, but they're still going to fund it and they're still going to help you get there. You recently, as part of the sort of process of releasing new songs or or, or sort of drip feeding uh, things out in advance of the album, you published some quite strong statements on Instagram and uh, about how the music business functions, including. Uh, you said this, um, nobody should be signing a bad record deal and perhaps nobody should be signing record deals at all. Now, uh, that's still a s- sort of vaguely provocative um, thing to say. <laughs> D- despite everything you just said, it's still, it's still seen by some as vaguely provocative and feels um, sort of provocative in its sort of independent nature. Let's talk about new artists. Should yeah. new artists not sign record deals? And what should they do? Well, of course, I'm definitely being provocative, uh, deliberately. So I'm also... Which is fine on this podcast. You're, you're more than welcome to uh, go down that route. I would never say you shouldn't or should um, sign a record deal. I think that people just need to know that you don't have to. Um, and people need to, know that what kind, uh, people need to know what kind of deals are out there. And I do think there are types of deals that you should never sign. I do think there are types. I don't. I, I really think that like a, a an in perpetuity deal you should never sign. I think that you know unless there are some incredible benefits to it, you shouldn't do anything where you're on like a traditional major label split. And uh, you know a lot of people don't know that you can do a fifty fifty license deal, like a five year license deal. A lot of artists don't know that that exists, um, and that is a that's a label situation. I would, you know, I'm not I'm, I'm not even advocating for that. I'm just saying people don't even know that that exists. Um, so I I just hate the idea of, you know, I know what it's like to be in your twenties and have some hype around you and have some energy around you and have you know, a couple of pieces of paper put in front of you. And, and, and those are going to be the first deals you ever see. And um, they're probably going to be terrible. Uh, but you're not going to know any other options. Um, and I think people should be deeply suspicious of those deals and, um, and be very, very careful. However sort of unpleasant it feels... People are going to, on both sides of a, of a negotiation, are going to try and push for the best deal for them. It's, it's, I guess, human nature. Yeah. But, of course, when you're negotiating with a multinational corporation the, and you're an artist who's had some some emerging hits and things are starting to happen, the, the, there's an obvious power imbalance there, right? Do you think there's a duty of care that is perhaps not being fulfilled by... I'm not. I'm not trying to pin the blame on record labels here, but I'm talking about the people who, in the, the entities in the industry who have the power, which, which is about scooping up young artists and developing them and releasing music. Let's say, do you think there's a duty of care that's not being fulfilled by those, those deals when they offer those early deals that are about nailing them down and then we can move on? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I do because it's still happening. Um... So, yeah, I do think there's a, a duty of care that's not being fulfilled. I, you're right, there is a tremendous power imbalance at that point. Not only that, but new artists don't know anything about negotiation, right? It's not a very... The artist's mind is not a negotiator's mind. We, um, <clears throat> you know, write songs in our bedroom so we don't have to go and do things like arguing with people. Um, and yes, when you have two parties doing a deal, each party is fighting for the best terms they can possibly have. When uh, um, a record label comes along to an artist that's never done anything before, they're going to... St- and, and, and often these artists have, have you know, new managers. It'll be a friend of theirs that's managing them, someone that come up, that's come up with them. 
um, they perhaps don't know what the options are. And I can't tell you the amount of people I know who are signed to record deals that they um, really don't like. And I think that that's sad um, and a bit of a a bit of an embarrassment for this for this industry, really. Um, I I I. I I get pretty upset by it, and I and I even know people, you know, in the last couple of years who established people who've been, um, you know, sort of slightly swindled into uh, sort of forever master ownership deals with with supposedly independent labels. Um, and I think if we talked more, I think if artists talked more and we were more open about what's what we're doing and what's available and what we think is fair, then these things would happen less and less. I mean, you mentioned earlier, and you're, you're talking about it there as well, the the desire for transparency. This is something artists have always wanted, perhaps felt afraid of pushing for, because you know, if you if you if you if you stand up and and make a noise, perhaps you that one deal will be taken away from you, and your opportunity is gone. You know, this Definitely. is very, it's a very powerful thing, isn't it? And there's the idea of the difficult artist is a very strong idea. It's you know this diva thing, this like you know, uh, uh, this, and also this sort of infantilization of the artist that is not a business person, that is not autonomous, that doesn't have control, um, is perpetuated. And, and you know, the, the stories I've heard about <clears throat> artists from the industry side, about so-and-so being very difficult about this or that, and then, yeah. you know, I'll actually meet that person. And... Um, it, it's not like that at all. Uh, and of course, you, you never meet any difficult, uh, deverish people working at uh, record labels, do you? Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, you, what we're talking about here then is perhaps the change. You know, this this idea for transparency. We're moving into an era where obviously people can people are talking online, but, and that's one level of information exchange. But we're actually talking about levels of transparency that are reaching sort of the saturation point where fans are pushing, that they're campaigning for their favourite artists to own their masters. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, the, the idea that, you know, five years ago, um, Taylor Swift's fans would be uh, rallying for her to, to to own her masters and understand what that means is kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? So you've also said that you're committed to creating a better situation for all artists in the music business. What is that? You, you've talked about positive alternatives, what you think of as better alternatives, what what are you doing to to sort of help make that happen? And what do you think that other artists who perhaps are listening to this and and are getting some pangs of familiarity can also do to help make a change for other people, but also for themselves? Well, it definitely starts with yourself. Um, I think if you do, you know, make some more space in a deal and make a better situation for yourself. Um, and build the kind of team that you want and have a good operation, it resonates. Um, It also, you can sort of show that something works. Again, it's about people understanding that there are other options. Um, And uh, and then the the biggest thing is talking about it and and having these conversations and having behind-the-scenes conversations with, with other musicians and sharing your experiences and, you know, coming to a point where you, where you might be sitting down with a few people and go, well, that thing isn't okay with any of us anymore. So, you know, let's make sure that we support each other in saying no to this. Um, a good example outside of the record side is this conversation that's going on about venues taking a cut from merch, yeah. right? <clears throat> All that needs to happen for that to change is for every or a majority of artists to go, we're not going to give you a cut of our merch. And yeah. that happens if we all have a conversation about it and go, this is dumb. Why are we letting these people tax us? Um, yeah. This is our product. And that, uh, that change in the UK, at least, is, is starting to happen now. We've yeah. seen in the last right. six months. And that's been um, through conversation, basically. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I often speak to emerging artists, perhaps aged... 1920 um and they're always hyper aware and worried as artists i think this is a terrible thing they're hyper worried about being ripped off they're hyper worried about putting their name on something and signing it i I guess in some ways that's a good thing right because they're they're aware of it but what might you say 
perhaps considering the person you were at 25, what might you say to a young emerging artist now who has those fears? What would you, how can they help themselves to perhaps gain that transparency and openness and connectivity to help them learn in an industry which still kind of feels from their perspective either impenetrable or sort of doesn't want to deal with people who stand up and say, um, I don't like this? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, first of all, uh, reach out to your favorite artists, you know, providing it's not Radiohead. And, you know, you'll probably get a response from them. And, and you can say, hey, I'm looking at a record deal at the moment with this label. And um, can I talk to you about it? I'm not sure what to do. And I'm pretty sure that you'll, you'll get a helpful response. Um, so speak to people in the same position as you who are a little bit more experienced and, and have that conversation. Don't be too proud to do that. Um, we've all had to take little steps before we've done big steps. Um, but absolutely, people are right to be suspicious. And they're suspicious because now, because of social media, we see all the horror stories and we see all the, you know... <laughs> disastrous um, positions that people have been put in. Um, I, I, I think <clears throat> that uh, when artists start, they think that what's going to happen is that there's going to be this constant explosion and they're going to just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and it's just going to be this kind of like rocket to the moon. Um, about three years later, most people realize that what you want is a sustainable career that you can make music and make your art and operate in for the rest of your life and the rocket ship and the sustainable career call for two completely different business models um look at you know the deals that people do in their 20s and the deals that people do in their 30s People often have to go through the moment where they think they're going to explode and be this massive thing to then realize that actually what they want is success through stability and to be able to flow. And then you, you can still be massive. You're just not kind of reliant on these sudden bursts and dips and bursts and dips of, of, of funky deals. Um, yeah, but if you are a new artist listening and you've got a deal in front of you, please speak to as many people as you possibly can uh, and, and, and just share the experience and ask questions, ask all the questions. Mm. And um, I, I guess you, you, may, you may get an influx of emails now, but I'm sure that's something that you would, you would welcome from emerging artists Definitely. To, to talk and to, to share. It'd be, I'd be honoured. <laughs> Well, they, they, there you go, folks. I won't put your personal uh, email address next to this <laughs> podcast, but I'm sure they'll be able to figure out how to get in touch with you on social media, where I guess people can also um, uh, follow you and uh, pay attention because your album is coming out uh, pretty soon, perhaps even around the time of this podcast, actually, mm -hmm. uh, if I can uh, get my act together and publish it in time. I would like to make a really quick final uh, statement, which is that I am self-releasing this album, and it's hard work, but it's so much fun and I'm having a great time, and it's the most satisfying project I've done as an artist yet, and I think that is because I'm self-releasing it. So I, I, I put my, I want to put my hat in the ring there and say it's a great thing to do. Right. Well, I will link to it beneath the podcast, so please Thank check you. it out, everybody. <laughs> uh, Orlando, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. And there we go. So if you found that useful, please share this podcast on with someone else who you think will also get something out of it. And if you'd like to email me and uh, give me your thoughts, it's joe at musically.com. It's joe at musically.com. Don't forget we have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up a bit of this and a bit of that, of the best analysis, news, marketing, insight and skills from Music Ally. There's a link below the podcast, so sign up and impress your boss. Uh, and don't forget as well, you can check out to see if you are eligible for a free Music Ally subscription. That link is also beneath the podcast. So that's it for me, Joe Sparrow. Uh, until next time, farewell.